Welcome everybody. Thank you for coming to an OTF Connect session tonight. You are here for STEAM learning in the early years. Our presenters are Aaron Cleesby and Jennifer Evans, who are from the Waterloo Region District School Board, and that's where I'm from as well. We have some amazing kindergarten uh, teachers in our board, and I'm thrilled to have them join us today. They truly are leaders with what they do. Their presentation is really full of terrific ideas for you. They have made so many connections to curriculum that I'll be putting one link into the grade one curriculum for you and uh, they'll uh, explain everything else to you as well. Like I said, everything's recorded including the chat. So if you miss any of the links, don't worry, they'll all be there. You also get a link to a resource page as well where I'll be putting a few things. So that's it for me right now. I'll be uh, moderating in the chat if anyone has questions, that kind of thing. If you do get bumped out of the room, don't worry. Head back to your guest link and come on back in. So that's it for me. And uh, let's welcome Erin Cleesby and Jennifer Evans. Take it away. Hello, and thank you for coming. Um, thank you, Trish, for moderating. It's great to have so many educators joining us tonight. And we thank you for taking the time out of your night to be with us. You can use the chat room to ask any questions throughout the session. And uh, feel free to ask us questions, share any ideas and thoughts as we go along. We're all here to learn together. Also, if you'd like to send us emails afterwards, if you think of questions after the sessions, sometimes it's during your reflection afterwards that you realize you have uh, further wonderings or questions about what we talked about tonight. Hello everyone and welcome to our webinar on STEAM learning in the early years. My name is Erin Cleesby and I'm a DECE in the Waterloo Board. This is my sixth year in a kindergarten classroom. So I have a particular interest in active learning with my kindergarten kids and I really like using picture books as a springboard for my lessons. I love the versatility of these parts um, and use these parts whenever I can in my classroom. I think the best part about you infusing STEAM learning experiences in my program is that I'm learning and developing a growth mindset along with my students. So thank you very much for joining us tonight on our journey. And as Jennifer said, feel free to ask any questions as we go along. And hi, I'm Jennifer Evans. I am a kindergarten teacher with the Waterloo Board. This is my 13th year of teaching and my fourth year teaching under the new FDK program. I enjoy introducing my students to technology and showing them how they can use it as a tool rather than a toy. I love using picture books in my classroom and opportunities to connect my students to other students in different places through global, global projects. My favorite part about STEAM experiences is that even the youngest students are able to show how creative and innovative they are. So we want to get an idea of who's with us tonight. So if you're a kindergarten educator, can you click on the green check mark? If you're a grade one educator, can you click on the red X? And if you're in a different role, maybe you can leave it blank and then just write in the chat box what you do. And it can be a minute to check that out. Ooh, Karen, you have a lot on your plate. JK, SK, grade one and two. Great. Two, Monique. Great. Planning time. Innovation. Innovation. Instructional coach. I like that title. Great. So we have lots of different people joining us tonight. So we're glad that you're here from different areas and that we can uh, help you uh, learn more about STEAM learning. So, we have a poll for you. Have you used STEAM in your classroom before? So if you can click on the poll, yes or no. A bit of both. Yeah, nice. We've got a lot of people who've done STEAM learning in their classrooms. Um, so let's talk about what is STEAM learning exactly. 
So this definition is from Education Closet, which is a website dedicated to arts integration and STEAM education. We really like this um, definition because we feel like it encompasses all the aspects of STEAM that Jennifer and I really do enjoy working with um, in our classrooms. So the definition says, STEAM is an educational approach to learning that uses science, technology, engineering, the arts, and mathematics as access points for guiding student inquiry, dialogue, and critical thinking. So when combining science, technology, engineering, the arts, and math, children are getting a deeper understanding, making stronger connections, and access higher order thinking skills, such as critical, logical thinking, reflective, and creative thinking as well. So in this aspect, STEAM allows children to ask questions and explore interests that are important and relevant to them. Um, so for those of you who had checked yes, that they are currently doing STEAM in their classroom, if you'd like to share, please feel free to use the chat or the microphone um, and share with us some ideas or some experiences that you have. So let's break down what the subject areas of STEAM are. So we start off with science. Now, science is the process of learning about and understanding the natural world. So for example, science encompasses life sciences, earth and space, and physical sciences. Basically, science is about asking questions. Next, we've got technology. Activities include computers, but it can also be the tools and simple machines that are used to make our jobs easier. Basically, technology, we need to think of technology as tools. It makes jobs easier. Technology can be electronic technology or it can be non-electronic. We have to think about both those aspects in our classroom when we're doing STEAM um, experiences. Um, on to engineering. It's the process of building and designing something to solve a problem. So engineers redesign to make things better. They look for problems and they try to make things better. Now, in the art aspect, um, it's the process of designing creative solutions to a problem. So Art is not just encompassing visual arts, but drama, dance, literature, and music. So when you're infusing art into your STEAM experiences, remember all those different aspects of, um, of the art uh, curriculum. And math, math is a process of understanding relationships among patterns, numbers, and shapes. So of course, we've got some, all of our five strands of mathematics, like number sense, geometry, and spatial sense, measurement, data management, probability, and patterning. Now, we need to talk about why would we learn STEAM, use STEAM learning in the early years. So we do this because research says that the integration of STEAM in the early years exposes young children to a problem-solving approach to learning that aligns with their own curiosity. The integration of STEAM in the preschool setting may spark an interest and increase preparation in these fields in the future, which could lead to interest in STEAM careers. And because statistics show, now these are Canadian statistics, that less than 50% of Canadian high school students graduate with senior STEM courses. And approximately 70% of Canada's top jobs require STEM education. So we can see that there's a big gap in what we know is important for our students to learn and what is needed in the future jobs and what students are currently interested in pursuing. So if we're teaching STEAM subjects starting in the early years and developing those skills, important skills, then hopefully our children are learning those skills and it's going to increase their interest and lead them to, towards pursuing an interest in one of those STEAM careers. Some of the skills develop through STEAM education, of course. Like I said before, higher order thinking skills such as critical and logical thinking. Um, of course, there's problem solving skills, creativity, innovation, and a growth mindset, which we'll definitely uh, talk a lot about tonight. Our goal in the end as educators, of course, is to empower our students. We want to give them confidence to, to design their own learning path and to have a vested interest in their own success. Using a STEAM approach does this because the challenges and experiences you plan in your classroom are based on the children's curiosities, questions, and wonderings. And upon reflection, you can kind of think about that STEAM naturally does fit into our kindergarten um, inquiry-based philosophy. Um, and some of you in the early years might also have that philosophy in your programs as well, of course. Uh, children, of course, are more interested in what they're doing when learning is based on their interests and done through hands-on active learning. Um, just a quick quote to share with you from Lillian Katz from the article STEM in the Early Years. She says, the best practice for early education is to allow students to be active, engaged, and take initiative in their own learning. So being allowed opportunities to take the initiative in their own learning is not only good for STEAM learning, but for overall long-term academic success. Okay, so 
why STEM, why STEAM? So brain scientists have been able to divide the brain into two main sections, the left and the right, and speculated that a set of skills and attributes are characteristic of each hemisphere. So for instance, left brain people tend to favor verbal instructions, math, logic, and multiple choice tests, while right-brained individuals are more likely to prefer demonstrative instructions, visual imagery, arts and music, and creative tasks. So students in STEM programs may have more experiential learning opportunities, but they are limited to only science, technology, engineering, and math. Our economy, as Erin was talking about, requires so much more than just an understanding in these areas. It requires application, creation, ingenuity, so STEM alone does not foster those essential nutrients. So STEAM is a way to take the benefits of STEM and complete the package by integrating the principles in and through the arts. STEAM takes STEM to the next level. It allows students to connect their learning in these critical areas together with arts practices, elements, design principles, and standards that provide the whole palette of learning at their disposal. Art encourages and requires exploration and emotional, emotional engagement and sense of ownership and flexibility, all of which are key ingredients for success in science. Um, so some examples of prominent personalities where they are using both sides of their brain, they're using the whole idea of STEAM. So Steve Jobs, Albert Einstein, Marissa Mayer, camouflage for soldiers in the United States Armed Forces was invented by an American painter named Abbott Thayer. Earl Bacon based his pacemaker on a musical metronome. And Japanese origami was inspired, helped inspire medical stents and improvements to vehicle airbag technology. So great ways that we can see in the real world applications where the arts was integrated with uh, science and technology, engineering and math. All right, so let's get into integrated learning and problem solving. And somebody just mentioned here that problem solving plus innovation does equal STEAM. And that's exactly right. That's, um, that encompasses what STEAM learning really is. Um, this quote here is from Susan Riley, again, at the Education Closet. STEM or STEAM, um, STEAM is obviously the integration of the arts aspect into it as well, is the intentional connection between two or more of these selected content areas to drive instruction through observation, inquiry, and problem solving. So STEAM is the intentional integration of those subject areas of science, technology, engineering, arts, math. The subject areas are working in tandem and not in isolation. So. This means that our students are using the skills and processes learned in those five areas to think deeply and ask non-Googleable questions and solve problems. Again, that was from Susan Riley from um, Education Closet. I really like her point there of ask non-Googleable questions and solve problems. So it really gets to the heart of what children are really interested in and what they're asking and not necessarily about what other people are interested in. It's really at the heart of their own personal interests. Um, so in order to start STEAM learning in your classroom, the first thing you're going to be doing is you must lay down the foundation first. So teaching you the skills such as learning about um, maybe a base of support when you're talking about building materials and uh, building towers and structures. So it's laying down the foundation first before your students are applying the knowledge via the STEAM experience or challenge that you're setting up. So if you're setting up a challenge such as um, trying to create a building with maybe some Oreo cookies and trying to build it as high as you can, then your foundational skills might be talking about what a base of support is and how your, you know, your tower of cookies might, you know, how you can get them as high as you can with that background knowledge. So STEAM really is about the application and the practice of curriculum-based skills where students are using their prior knowledge and experience to construct new knowledge within the other subject areas. So, for example, we're going to talk a little bit about what STEAM is and what STEAM in, is not. So not a, a STEAM experience that is not really a STEAM experience is when you're doing a large group discussion about how to measure. So that's the laying the foundation, that's the teaching of the skills. And it's not about playing a math game. That's, again, the laying of the foundational skills. On another example is how technology um, is included and embedded in a lot of our practices in our classroom. So just because you're embedding technology like, say, an iPad into something, it does not mean necessarily that you've steamified uh, your lesson or your experience. 
um, watching a YouTube video, for example, on what snails like to eat isn't um, integrating technology. It's you're still learning about science. It, it, you, you've got to be learning through the technology or using the technology to further your um, knowledge of your interested subject area. So that's what STEAM learning is not. So on the other hand, though, what is a STEAM learning experience? It's an open-ended exploration. Um, in my classroom, we use a lot of loose parts. They're a big part of the process in STEAM learning because they have no set parameters of use. Uh, STEAM learning is about observing, assessing, and documenting how our students are reaching a solution or conclusion. It's about real-world problems, their interests, their wonderings, questions topics relevant to our students' lives. And STEAM experiences are grounded in the expectations of the curriculum. Of course, we're always going back to the curriculum and um, how we're setting up our challenges and experiences if we're integrating our STEAM subjects. So now, well, inquiry often does stem from the child. Teachers, though, educators can stimulate investigation through carefully posed questions related to the child's play. So it's our job as educators to be watching what the children are doing, what questions that they have, and going from there. So our intentional teaching through this inquiry presents more interesting questions for children to answer and moves their learning forward into our STEM experiences. All right. So on to creating a STEAM culture in the classroom. So we want to build a strong foundation for STEAM learning in our classroom by teaching the skills of inquiry, questioning, observing, and communicating. So effective, engaging STEAM education capitalizes on students' early interests and experiences, identifies and builds on what they know, as Erin said, and provides opportunity to engage in the practices of science and mathematics to sustain the interest. So in the other words, Throughout their schooling, students are learning to investigate questions about the world that they come across in daily life in much the same way that scientists and mathematicians do. And in our classrooms, Erin and I talk to our kids a lot about being scientists and mathematicians and engineers and artists and lots of different things that they can do. So how do we do this? How do we create a STEAM culture in our classroom? stock the classroom. So what can we stock our classroom with for STEAM experiences? Uh, lots of nonfiction books. Erin talked about loose parts that will encourage open-ended explorations and assigning made-up rules and roles to these materials. Lots of recycled materials. Office supplies, you see in the second uh, picture there, uh, there's some paper clips there. There's elastics, uh, clothespins, string, plastic cups. Um, some materials that you may already have in your classroom. Um, in our kindergarten classrooms, we have some blocks and other commercial, commercial materials that can be used for STEAM, for STEAM activities. You just might use them in a different way. Um, you could have activities that might have uh, limited supplies, so they may only be able to use certain supplies for this activity, but you may also have STEAM challenges where they can use uh, anything that they can find in the classroom. And we're going to share with you some examples of those two different kinds of activities uh, later on. So ask powerful questions. What's a powerful question, Jen? Well, powerful questions are questions that um, allow the children to give you more information. So things like, is it a car? Where they're going to say yes or no. It's kind of, are not really powerful questions. It's kind of like those questions we encourage our parents to ask their kids about their day. The, you know, when the parent says to them, did you have a good day, they're going to get yes or no. But when they can ask them specific questions about what they did throughout their day, then they're going to get more information from the children. So I have I have a little uh, quiz for you. Instead of what is it, what would be a more powerful question? Is it a pumpkin? Why does it have big and little eyes? Why are there different color of pipe cleaners? So what you can do is use your clip art maybe and put a clip art on the question that you think would be the most powerful question. And Trisha has posted a uh, link to an article that talks about dollar questions, penny and dollar questions. And it just kind of helps you move along that stream from asking, you know, is it um, 
sorry, I like your pants. Or, sorry, does, does anyone have any questions to asking the more in-depth questions about what, um, what you're talking about? So a lot of people are putting on B and C. And there really was B and C were the answers that we, were, we thought those questions were a little more powerful questions because it allows the child to give you more information about their, their structure or their creation that they built. And maybe it's not even a pumpkin just because it's orange plastic Play-Doh and on an orange plastic uh, placemat doesn't necessarily mean that it is actually a pumpkin. Yes, tell me about it. This is another one. Uh, thank you, Barbara. This is another open-ended uh, question that allows the child to tell you whatever, rather than narrowing in on one specific thing about their structure, it allows them to tell you do everything and anything they want about their structure. So pay attention to what the children are doing, asking, and representing in their play. The potential for quality STEAM experiences presents themselves every day. We just need to notice and respond to what the children are doing. We may need to point out connections or links between what the children know and what they want to know. Talk about their life. Talk about what's going on in their life. Talk about what's going on in the school. Good STEAM instruction capitalizes on real-world, authentic topics and interests that will engage the student. Talk in general. Compare. Think out loud. Describe what you see. Talk about your five senses. So for example, uh, Aaron's going to show you a picture later on. Um, that you can you could share pictures that you can show and talk about that have real world application for them or something that's meaningful for them. Uh, follow first, then lead second. So set up provocations based on the children's questions and wonderings, then allow the children to take the initiative in their learning. So instruction can be differentiated for students. Your curriculum goals for one student may be different than for another. Um, based on their developmental, sta developmental stage and learn along with the children. I think that the children find it very interesting that when we don't know everything, um, they like to learn along with us. Uh, Aaron mentioned earlier some growth mindset. So STEAM learning is very um, beneficial for growth mindset and in my classroom I talk a lot about fail and that it's okay to fail and fail really means first attempt in learning. So as educators, it's our job, we believe, to help further the children's curiosity and shape the way they learn and for the future. So uh, Carol Dweck termed the, the, coined the term growth mindset and it's the idea that when people change their beliefs about their own efforts, they can better adapt to create, create, sorry, to create successful outcomes. So when you believe that you will succeed after practice and effort, your odds of doing so improve. So it's a really powerful theory that has gained a lot of popularity in schools and businesses across the country. So one of the great best ways to incorporate some children's mindset is some uh, growth mindset in books. There's lots of great picture books that um, help show what growth mindset is. Um, Flight School is a really good one. Uh, there's one about the, ch the the girl who never failed. Anything is possible. Oh, magnificent thing. So lots of great picture books out there that um, will help you bring that to your kids. So here's a, an example of a challenge that we did in our classroom. Uh, we've been reading the Five Little Pumpkins poem, which I'm sure that most people are familiar with. Five Little Pumpkins sitting on a gate. Excuse me. And then the children were given materials, um, some blocks, um, craft sticks, tubes, clothespins, and then pumpkins. And their job was to create a gate for the pumpkin to sit on. So uh, what really stood out for me in my classroom on the left hand side, the one that was the pumpkin, the tower that's really, sorry, the gate that's really tall was created by a child in my classroom who doesn't have great um, self-regulation. 
but he kept building his tower, his gate higher and higher and higher, and he persevered and um, really showed self-regulation that I don't see from him very often. So that was a really great, um, uh, a great activity for him. And my little friend in the middle, um, he kept building and his kept falling apart, but he just kept looking at me and laughing, and then he'd go back and he'd try it again. So it was great to see the perseverance in one of my smallest, uh, smallest students in that classroom. All right, so are there any questions so far? Um, if you would like to use a microphone, of course, you're welcome to. Uh, you can also write your questions in the chat section. We're going to move on to um, each of our five content areas of STEAM in particular. But if you have a question, throw it in the chat room. Um, if we want to get to that before we kind of get into more details. Um, we've been asked uh, some of the books that we use for growth mindset. So Flight School, The Most Magnificent Thing. Um, there's a few other books that um, you may see in our pictures that we might mention. Uh, Rosie Revere, Engineer, Iggy Peck, Architect. And Ada Twist Scientist by Andrea Beatty are great uh, series of books for a growth mindset. Um, Eleven Experiments That Failed is another one I can think of. Lots of different books that you can uh, use in your classroom as a, a springboard for talking about how failure can be um, a good road to success. All right, so I can see Jennifer is uh, answering some of our questions here. Um, STEAM can be overwhelming, of course, um, but I bet you, you're probably, if you really think about it, you're, we're probably all pretty much doing STEAM in our classroom right now. So if STEAM is the integration of two or more subject areas, we're probably already doing that in our classroom. Science and math go hand in hand a lot. Um, technology is used, the arts, we allow our students to be creative and innovative and express themselves of what they know about science through the arts. Uh, maybe they're... Um, for example, I had my kids interested in uh, building the birdhouses, about wh what the birds do in the winter. So laying the foundation, we talked about what kinds of birds live in our area, uh, what kinds of uh, food and what kinds of shelter they might need in the winter. And then through that, uh, through that interest and in that in inquiry, they decided to make birdhouses and put them out into our plant yard to see um, if the birds would go into them and stuff. So we're learning about science via the access road of the arts. Um, all right, so Jen's answering some questions as we go along. Feel free to keep uh, asking those questions in the chat room, and uh, whoever's not talking will uh, keep answering your questions. So let's go on to uh, science. So science, I said before, is the process of learning about and understanding the natural world. So, like I said, too, scientists ask questions. Basically, at the end of the day, that's what a scientist does. They ask questions. There's three components of science. Um, one is Earth and space. So this is where you're talking about patterns of change over time, the observation of objects in space, Earth's components like rocks and shells, um, changes in weather, the patterns of day and night. Shadows is in the subject area of Earth and space. Another subject or another subsection of science is the physical sciences. Um, so you're talking about physical properties of materials, the movement of objects, forces that affect materials. Um, these include sensory experiences, magnetism, weight, shape, texture, color, temperature, uh, your simple machines, and like I said before, talking about base of support, that type of thing, is all in your physical sciences. The third subsection of science is life. So talking about living things. So you're talking about differentiating between living and non-living, perhaps, plants, animals, uh, when you're growing things in your classroom, when you're building habitats, you're talking about growth cycles, and really having an appreciation and respect for plants and animals. So that's encompassed in the life section of science. <clears throat> Excuse me. So after we kind of review the... Um, the topic uh, or our, our subject areas, our individual subject areas of STEAM, we are going to show some examples from our classrooms and make some connections to the grade one curriculum and to the kindergarten curriculum. So you see on the screen there that we've identified in kindergarten problem solving innovation 24.4 and that says select and use tools, equipment and materials to construct things. We've identified for grade one, 
within the science and understanding structures and mechanisms, 2.4. So that's about using technological problem solving skills and knowledge acquired from previous investigations to design, build, and test a structure for a specific purpose. So in this picture, um, you see a chain reaction machine. Now, chain reaction machine is uses natural forces like gravity and uh, elasticity to make something happen. The chain, of course, is a series of simple devices like a lever or some dominoes that knock into each other. And the idea is to put together a few of these devices so that they go off one right after the other. Obviously, once you put the first one in motion, the rest of the machine should go off by itself. Um, so the interest in the chain reaction machine was in the cause and effect of the ball rolling down the ramp. So what you see in this picture are some materials that we're using for our outdoor play. <coughs> The kids set up the white ramps um, in the structures, and really it was just a matter of rolling the ball, as I said, cause and effect. So in order to kind of further this uh, play, this inquiry, um, I kind of set them up with this chain reaction. I explained what a chain reaction machine was. I took some of those black pieces you see sitting on the tarmac. I set them up as like a dominoes, and I said, here, watch this. What, what do you think is going to happen? Once the dominoes fell down, what more could you do? What else, what else could we do here? This is a chain reaction machine. So that's what I was teaching them. I was, I was, we were talking about if the ball is acting as a force, what would be the result? Well, obviously, it's going to push down the first domino. Then this is going to happen, and this is going to happen. We're really trying to get the kids to think <coughs> excuse me, outside of the box and to try to further their knowledge of simple machines. And again, like I said, getting beyond the simple cause and effect of the ball rolling down the ramps. So in this picture, so this experience, oh, science is the physical science, of course, the movement and forces um, aspect in the simple machines. Um, we've incorporated technology, which is the ramps, the balls, and then the other pieces of the toys that the kids incorporated into the machine. The engineering part is the building and the readjusting of the pieces. Um, and the math part about it is the angles, the measurement, for example, the space between the black pieces that were set up like dominoes and all that kind of stuff um, <clears throat> to, uh, to get the machine to actually activate. Now, Rube Goldberg is, uh, was an author, a cartoonist, and an engineer. Um, he was an inventor who designed complicated machines to complete simple tasks. So I talked to the kids about that too. The end result is that you want the ball to go through the set of toys. A complicated machine, I mean, you could just roll the ball set through the set of toys, of course, but the Rube Goldberg machine is involving all these other practices of simple machinery to get that accomplished. All right, so our next thing is um, an experience I did in my classroom, kind of based off of the chain reaction. We called it Make It Move. <coughs> So this was presented as a challenge based on my students' love of designing the chain reaction machines outside. So using what we know about the movement, like rolling, sliding, and what we know about forces such as pushing or pulling, my challenge was, can you make a toy car move without touching it or pushing it with your hand? So the science behind this, um, experience was, of course, now in the physical sciences, using simple machines and forces. Technology, they use ramps, they use balls, blocks, dominoes, whatever they could find in the classroom I allowed. Um, but like I said, the challenge was not to use their hands. So the engineering part, they had to readjust their machine in order to get the car to roll farther um, and therefore bump into the dominoes as a second reaction. And the math, of course, again, we're talking about angles of the ramps, measurement with the space between the dominoes and from one end of the ramp to the first domino. Now, the one picture with, um, with the blue piece of paper, my little guy, um, one of my little JKs, he wrote a set of steps. <clears throat> so he explained that first the ball was going to roll, it was going to hit the blocks, and then it was going to fall into more blocks. So that was his steps. So now he's really thinking outside the box. He's making a plan. Um, he's using what he knows about writing and taking this experience one step further um, without even any prompt from myself. It was just what he, <clears throat> how he processes this type of learning. And you can see on the screen there the uh, curriculum connections.
Okay, so I can see Jennifer answering some of our questions at the side. Um, we're on to um, Matland and a picture of a loose parts kit called My City, My Home. So I'm going to talk about Matland first. Uh, Matland is a book by Hazel Hutchins. <clears throat> it's about a boy named Matt who uses his imagination to create his own neighborhood, which he calls Matland. So for this science and engineering experience, we've provided natural loose parts, such as tree cookies and rocks, and also some cars, maybe some more um, commercial products as well. There's some um, plastic animals involved here and hula hoops um, for the students can, to construct their own land. So it's about how they're connecting with the story in the book and what they, how they want to show their own land, what's important to them within the company, um, within the circle of the hula hoop. Um, now, the My City, My Home is a loose parts kit that I designed to be a part of a block play. So my design of this kit was to encourage children to identify with their community and themselves. So to, children can also learn about positional language, mapping, building, coding, and perspective taking um, during uh, an experience like this. Um, so I just want to share the picture I have here was uh, one of my little guys. He has a very strong connection to church in his family and his culture. So he has used the parts, the loose parts of this kit, to create a church. He explained that the blue jewels are fire. They, um, he made a cross at the front of the church. There are statues of people. Um, he used rocks as benches. So he's representing what's important to him using these loose parts. So the loose parts in this aspect is the technology. Uh, the art is how he decided to present the model that he has created to represent the church he attends with his family. And of course, the science aspect is the life science of thinking about living things and habitats. <clears throat> so you can see our grade one connection is to Hi folks, yeah, we just lost sound a little bit. Uh, it could be an internet connection on our moderator's end. It will catch up and you might hear their voices go a little bit quicker, but uh, all will be well once they get back on. Jennifer, if you can hear me, uh, you might want to check and see if you're hardwired and check your connection. That might help out. Okay, folks, so it's online presentation and I can see from my screen that our uh, moderators are trying to reboot so they can get back to uh, connect with you. I'm sure it won't take them too long to get logged back into the room. Uh, it might be a good chance for some of you. If you want to, you can still continue to put questions in the chat. Uh, you might also, if you've got your curriculum books nearby, they've got some terrific links there for you. And uh, let's see, uh, feel free to have conversation with each other if you want to ask about a few things. My one comment so far would be about the purchase of materials. And uh, I'm on the Waterloo board as well and I know being a, a faithful union member that we really don't want to have anybody purchasing their own materials at all if possible. I know I did uh, some garage sales or looked for donations, that kind of thing. But whenever possible, I checked with my administration, took my uh, receipts in, made sure that they paid for as many things as possible. Thanks for being patient, folks. I'm going to go and check my email, see if I can uh, get in touch with our moderators. I'll be right back.
thanks for keeping the conversation going in the chat. I did receive an email from our moderators. They are trying to get logged back in. Ah, loose parts at Value Village. And remember, receipts whenever possible for these things. Hello, everyone. Can you, uh, Trish, can everybody hear me now? Good to have you back. Sure, uh, Sorry about that. That's okay. I stalled. I had a great a time panic. talking about parts and, <laughs> oh, oh, and good. curriculum. So whenever you're ready, take it away. Fantastic. All right. So we've a call, we've uh, dealt with Matland and my city, my home. So we're going to go on to our uh, third example of uh, science in our STEAM experiences. This was done in my classroom this year. Um, I called it magnet art. Uh, what we had done was. Um, this experience actually started when two students strung wooden beads on a lace and swung it back and forth like a pendulum. So after I saw them do that, I did a group lesson on how the string swings differently if a different amount of beads is strung onto it. So I asked questions such as what else swings back and forth by itself after you get it started. Um, sure enough, one of my little guys said um, a swing. And this got us started about pushing and pulling and gravity as forces. So again, we're laying that foundational work about simple machines. And so then we wondered why the string um, eventually stopped swinging. And when we attached a magnet wand, um, it was a very heavy item I had in the classroom. Why we, when we attached that magnet wand at one, at one side, um, why it swung a little bit longer than the lighter bead. So we kind of experimented with that. And of course, it was a magnet wand. So I placed some loose parts um, on the floor. One of my students said, I think that the magnet wand will stop because it'll stick to it. So the magnetic objects um, will stop the magnet from swinging on the floor. So he's really using his, his background knowledge maybe of the swing and uh, what we just talked about of how pendulums swing and about forces and gravity. Um, and he knows what a magnet, what happens with a magnet. So he's kind of incorporating all those experiences, pre previous experiments, um, experiences into this one um, activity. So to take it a step further, um, after we played with the magnet wand, we decided to include the art aspect to visually actually see how magnets can be an acting force. So there's a magnet underneath the pieces of paper, and it's dragging other magnets through paint to create um, a, some kind of artwork. And then, of course, I did blue and, and yellow to hopefully kind of get the kids to keep out color mixing as well. So the science involved here, of course, we just said it was about forces and movement. The art um, is a visual representation of our scientific findings. And obviously, some color mixing got added in there, too. And the technology involved are the magnets, the loose parts, um, which included the paper clips, the washers, and the bolts. So kindergarten connections, of course, problem solving and innovation. So we're using our problem solving skills and their imagination to create visual art forms. Uh, so for the grade one science understanding, matter and energy, we can say that we are understanding matter and energy in our lives to demonstrate an understanding that energy is what makes the things that we do or see um, happen in our lives. All right. Is, are we good? Does anybody have any time? questions about science? All right, okay. All right, okay. I think Jennifer's going to take over for technology. <laughs> All right, thanks, guys. Thank you for your patience for that little technological difficulty there. Um, so T is for technology, and these include activities that um, may be using the computer, but are also tools and simple machines that are used to make our jobs easier. So an example is technology integrates with science and math primarily through the tools that the children employ the for observation, experimentation, and measurements. And this is from uh, teaching STEM in the early years. So things like magnifying glasses, tongs, eyedroppers, funnels, plastic knives, these are all tools and would be considered technology. So technology as a tool can also incorporate simple machines like inclines, pulleys, and they themselves can become a focus of experiments. So think about the chain reaction that Aaron showed with you, uh, shared with you earlier. There's lots of tools that are used in there. 
So technology can have two purposes. It can enhance the scientific learning by expanding opportunities to observe and experiment, for example, magnifying glasses, or they can study the technology itself, so pulleys to enhance their understanding of science. So some examples of things that we've done in our classrooms. Um, so this is uh, cardboard structures. This is when presented with a variety of tools, scissors, tape, glue, string, which will the students use to create a cardboard building? So they actually didn't really use very many of those tools. They were able to use scissors to um, cut notches in the cardboard to fit the cardboard together to create a structure just using the cardboard. And I think a little bit of tape. So there's an understanding of the physical properties of a structure, such as balancing it, the base, forces, so will the weight of the other pieces be the force to take into consideration. Engineering, so they're persisting in making the building better, such as holding it together more securely, building it higher, or adding different design elements like a second floor or stairs. So art is they're representing an idea. So in grade one, uh, visual arts, we connected this with the visual arts um, a, a expectation. Uh, 1.4, using a variety of materials, tools, and techniques to respond to a design challenge. And in kindergarten, we used uh, self-regulation and well-being. So 2.2, demonstrating a willingness to try a new experiment, experience, sorry, new experience, experimenting with new materials, tools, selecting and persisting with ideas that are challenging. Uh, they're also demonstrating independence, so self-regulation and willingness to take responsibility in their learning and other endeavors. Uh, coding is uh, something that is a particular passion of mine. So lots of tools that can be used in coding and technology, of course. On um, the right-hand side, you can see the Osmo kit, which is used with the iPads. But also on the left-hand side, you see some unplugged coding. So they're using tools like a uh, piece of paper with arrow, um, little gems. Uh, we use tape, and that's just a piece of laminating that was left over from our laminating machine. And we created a grid on it. And the children were able to create their own little story using the, the gems. I believe the double gems on some of the squares were representing uh, trees, so they had to go around it. And then they had, um, there was a little boy who he used a couple of blue gems to represent water, and then he created a card that was the water symbol that they had to go around the water or through the water. So in coding, the simplest form is that it's telling a, a computer or a person what you want it to do. So that involves giving step-by-step -step commands or directions for the computer or the person to follow. So there's lots of development of design and problem-solving skills, promotes computational thinking, it's a type of storytelling, so it has a logical beginning, a progression, and an ending. And it supports, it supports the development of early childhood numeracy and literacy. Plugged in coding allows them to learn how to create and express themselves creatively, creatively using technology. Um, and again, going back to that technology used as a tool and not a toy. So in grade one, we connected with this with uh, mathematics, uh, geometry, and spatial sense. So describing the relative locations of objects or people using positional language. And in kindergarten, uh, problem solving and innovating 4.1, using a variety of strategies to solve problems, including problems arising in social situations, so trial and error, cross-checking, um, and just, just demonstrating the ability to use these problem solving skills in a variety of contexts. Yes, uh, Vanessa, there are lots of really great books that introduced coding to kindergarten. Uh, one of the ones that Erin and I really like is called Hello Ruby. And the author of Hello Ruby has a really great TED talk that um, if you want to get an introduction as to why we should teach coding to our kids, that's a really good one to watch as well. There's also one called Unplug Doug. Um, that's a good one too. Uh, the picture that you see there, there's um, Follow That Map. The one with the little girl on the front, Naomi, is um, that's Hello Ruby. Uh, there's a, the Follow the Map is the one that's there. And the Get Kids Coding is the, the yellow one that you can see there. And then I think on the far, far away uh, with the, like, the purple and the kind of yellow, that's Unplugged Doug. 
So Intuitive Art for Spring was an activity that um, we did in my classroom last year. Um, my sister actually came in and did it. She's an art uh, art teacher and has a, a, she's an expert. I would say she's an expert, so she helped me out with this. And this is a uh, layered activity. So they actually had four layers that they did. So they used lots of different tools. They used sponge brushes. They used their fingers. So the first layer was they had three colors that they color up, used the sponge brushes to cover the page with. Oh, sorry, I should leave this up with saying that the introduction to this was we talked about spring. So I talked about brainstorm, what their ideas were about spring, and um, what they thought about, how they felt in spring, what it smelled like, so using all of their senses. And then they did the first layer. The second layer, they chose one color, and they used their finger to kind of play the piano on the page uh, and fill it with little fingerprints. The third layer was um, they got uh, gold or uh, silver, and they used the sponge brushes to add that color to their uh, their art. And then the last layer was um, stamps that represented um, uh, spring. So we see some spiders and some butterflies, and they were able to choose which one they wanted. And they used black, so they were using the rollers to, to put the black on, and then the stampers to stamp a um, pattern on their picture as well. And they really enjoyed it, and even um, the youngest guys who are using that to into art were excited about being able to complete it. And um, we did this in one setting. Uh, actually, sorry, we did this over two days, um, but she did use acrylic paint because it dries a little bit faster. But they were very excited to have her come back and to be able to finish the project with her the next day. So visual arts, grade one, uh, creating a two- and three-dimensional works of art that express feelings and ideas inspired by personal experiences. And uh, in the kindergarten document, demonstrating literacy and math behaviors, so they were responding express their responses to visual art forms by making connections to their own experiences or by talking about the form. So they were expressing their responses to visual arts um, through their thoughts about science and, and using their own ideas on what colors they wanted to use for that. Uh, the last uh, technology one is about exploring the passage of time. So this is talking about um, thinking about shadows and how the shadows can help us tell time. And there's different tools that you can see there um, that were helping them do that. So this came from a quote from a JK student who asked, where do shadows come from? Um, and then we talked about when something's in front of the sun and how will the shadow leave you? Um, and so it came through an explanation of exploration or inquiry of the kids about shadows. So this student had thought about shadows before, possibly asked a student, uh, sorry, an adult about them. Um, we can explore the passage of time through the student's understanding of shadows and the different positions of the sun. So understanding that the sun goes away at night and reappears in the day, and using our bodies to draw a chalk outline of shadows at different times through the day as tools. So using the chalk and our bodies as tools to have a way of measuring time. And this, the picture on the uh, bottom right shows you the different uh, student figures at different times throughout the day. So the pencil uh, is a book on the by Alan Alberg, and it's a book about creation, individuality, and the importance of having an identity. So there once was a lonely pencil, and one day it decided to draw an entire world. Then it drew a paintbrush to color it, but not everyone was happy, so it drew an eraser. Uh, so technology, in this case, uh, pencils, erasers, paintbrushes, chalk, even the, the Lego, and, and even the, the kids using their bodies to uh, show the shadows on the pavement. There's a connection to science, earth and space, and to math, measuring the day. And then, so um, the grade one curriculum, so science, and understanding so matter and energy, that's the connection to the sun. And uh, kindergarten demonstrating literacy and math behaviors, 14.1. So asking, question. asking, asking questions and describing natural occurrences. 
All right, we're going on to E for engineering. So engineering is the process of building and designing something to solve a problem. So like I said before, engineers look for problems to solve. We're going to take a look at another loose parts kit that I designed. It's called Building Up, and it's a loose parts kit um, to support block play. So the materials are conducive to stacking, for bridging, acting as support pieces. So within using these materials, students are developing visual spatial um, intelligence during the block play and um, as we manipulate the materials to build upwards and outwards. So the encouragement is to stack the materials and to go up instead of necessarily outwards, which a lot of kids um, at this age uh, range do. Um, so an engineer does use his or her visual spatial awareness to imagine how various forces may affect the design of a structure. So that's kind of what we're trying to get the kids to um, really think about and build upon um, as they use these materials. So it's, uh, the engineering aspect, of course, is experimenting with different designs to learn why some designs work um, and why others fall down. And the science behind it is, again, in the physical sciences, um, talking about stability, weight, balance, gravity, basis support, forces, that type of thing. Um, so, of course, in grade one, the connection is with math, um, geometry, and spatial sense, building 3D structures, um, using concrete materials, and describing two-dimensional shapes that structures contained. Uh, kindergarten. Uh, one of the connections I made here with this experience was in the belonging and contributing 30.2 and that one talks about how children can explore a variety of tools, materials and processes of their own choice to create drama, dance, music and visual art forms in familiar and new ways. All right, so our next, next example is one from Jen's classroom. Um, so this was actually done as a whole school challenge. Um, in my school, once a month, we get together in different grades and do a, a STEAM challenge. And this is one we did uh, right before Halloween, uh, therefore the Halloween candy catapult. And the children had um, elastics, masking tape, cups, spoons, straws, paper clips, uh, and of course the little candy. And their challenge was to use those materials to create a uh, catapult for the candy. Now my class of kindergartens was, was paired up with um, grade sevens, so um, they were really interested to work with their older friends in our school, and it was interesting to see how engaged the grade sevens were. Um, so engaged, in fact, I think that they kind of <laughs> left the kindergartens behind a little bit and forgot that they were supposed to be working with them. So um, after the STEAM challenge was officially finished, uh, a few of my friends came to me and said, we didn't really get a chance to do anything. Can we have the materials to work on it still? And I happened to have all those materials in my closet. And so we brought them out again. And uh, they were able to continue working on building their own uh, catapults of some sort. And they worked all day that day. And the next day, and it carried on for a couple of days, uh, building catapults or different kinds of structures or simple machines that they wanted to use. So it was kind of interesting to see how they carried it for, through for a, a couple more days. So we connected this with um, grade one science, understanding of structures and mechanisms. So describing the properties of materials that enable objects and structures to be made for them to perform their intended purpose. And kindergarten problem solving and innovation, selecting and using materials to carry out their own explorations. Uh, this is another one that we did in our classroom, an Oreo cookie challenge. And this one was actually connected with um, a site that I use, Projects by Jen. Um, so you had the opportunity to um, stack Oreo cookies. And um, I'll tell you now that we have a way uh, for them not to eat them. <laughs> we we kind of rolled them in sand first, in blue sand, So because we talked about how they were dirty and we really didn't want to eat them yet. And I really didn't have any kids that tried to eat them after that. But the, the challenge was to stack as many cookies on top of one another as they could. And once they started stacking, they couldn't change them. So they got uh, three tries to do it. So each time they tried to stack them higher. And they were able to see how they placed the cookie um, to see how it be, would be more stable. and. Uh, if it would fall over. You can see the one on the left has a little bit of curve to it, whereas the one on the right, um, they've, they caught the idea that they had to be 
gentle and slow and stack them as high as they could. So we, we extended that by having them count their cookies and we made a graph and um, we were able to kind of compare each other's to see who did the highest. And uh, through the project we had to find an average in our class and then we recorded our average and that was recorded with the project of all the people that participated in it. So this connected to number sense enumeration. We connected that to the number sense enumeration in grade one, one-to-one -one correspondence, and to the uh, demonstrating literacy and math behaviors in kindergarten. Again, making use of one-to-one -one correspondence and counting out items and matching groups of items. So Iguipec Architect um, is a wonderful book, and Erin talked a little bit before about Rosie Revere engineer and um, Ada Twist scientist. Iguipec Architect is also by the same author, her name was Andrea Beattie. And um, we read this as an example of kind of an open, uh, where materials were concerned. The catapult was kind of a closed, they only had certain activities, this one was kind of more open. So we read this story, but we only read to a certain point. Um, and Iggy is a, a child who likes to build, and he likes to build lots of different things. But his teacher had a poor experience with um, getting stuck on the Empire State Building, I believe, when she was a, a small child, and she did not like big buildings. So she told Iggy, no more building. You can't build. We don't build in grade two or grade three. I can't remember. I'm sorry. Um, until they go on a field trip. And they go on a field trip to an island, and while they're on this island, the bridge washes away. And that's where we stopped reading in our class. And the challenge I put out to the kids is, how are you going to help the children get to the other side of the island? Because the other thing is, once the bridge washed away, Iggy's teacher fainted away. So she was really no help. So Iggy took control, and the children worked together to build uh, a bridge to get to the other side. But I stopped there and gave the children the challenge of how can you build something that will help the children get to the other side. And they have, were able to use any of the materials in the classrooms. So you can see that when some children used uh, step cubes, some children um, used just pieces of shirt cardboard and corks. And then on the right hand side you can see that somebody even decided to draw a plan. And we had a couple of students that made a plan before they started building. So we connected this to um, math in grade one, uh, geometry and spatial sense, build three-dimensional structures using concrete materials, and describe the two-dimensional shapes that the structures contain. Um, kindergarten demonstrating literacy and math, so responding to a variety of materials that have been read to out to them. Um, so paint, draw, or construct models of characters or settings. Uh, Megan asked, any ideas related to Christmas? Yes, we have quite a few ideas that we had used related to Halloween because that was some of the timing that has been recently. Um, but uh, we like to use uh, picture books, as Erin is saying, to incorporate uh, into our classrooms and to make challenges from them. And Erin's uh, put one in there using Pete the Cat Saves Christmas. So the question of, can you build a vehicle for Pete to deliver the presents to all the boys and girls in the world? Candy catapult, snowflake catapult, or a Christmas tree catapult, or a present catapult. So just wanted to check in again with you all before we continue on to the last two subject areas of our STEAM explanation. Um, anything that you'd like clear, further clarification on? Uh, we're trying to answer our questions in the chat, um, but if there's anything in specific um, that we've already talked about um, that you want further cl clarification on, feel free to uh, raise your hand or uh, throw that in the chat as well. All right, so let's go on to art here. Um, so art, of course, the process of designing creative solutions to a problem. And like I said before, arts, the arts encompasses visual arts, drama, dance, literature, and music. It's um, a lot of times we tend to think of art as just visual arts, but don't forget about those other aspects uh, where children can actually um, have experience and they shine through um, drama or dance, for example, or music. So um, again, from Susan Riley from Education Closet, she says that integrating the arts 
into STEM. Uh, learning allows for creativity, innovation, and meaningful learning. So that's where she really believes that the integration of arts is important, is, is that it's allowing those aspects, the creativity, innovation, um, for children into STEM um, experiences. Now, uh, this picture here, you see uh, a storytelling experience of the three little pigs. So students have used loose parts and materials from around the classroom to build and create a story center for the three little pigs. So they've used this to retell the story to their classmates and create their own versions of the story. So the art connection here is the dramatic story retell. Uh, the technology, of course, is the loose parts um, and it moves and of their choice, um, given by the teacher or by uh, um, scoring the classroom to try to find um, anything that they felt was relevant to the story. And the engineering um, part of, of course, it was the building the three little pig houses um, as, part of, as part of the retelling of the story. So the arts is the dramatic part in grade one and the demonstrating of literacy and math behaviors in kindergarten where you're um, retelling uh, the story either orally or through nonverbal communication um, in proper sequence. <clears throat> so um, another experience that um, that might be good for uh, a little bit older students um, is circuits. So now um, on the left hand side there you see the little Play-Doh frog and that's using squishy circuit, circuits with Play-Doh. So a squishy circuit is one piece of Play-Doh is the conductor so electricity is flowing through it. And the other piece of Play-Doh is the insulator, so it does not allow electricity to flow through it. You can go to squishycircuits.com, and it has the recipes to use, lessons, and it's got materials that you can, that you can purchase. And um, so it's really showing the kids <coughs> a creative way um, to show their understanding of how um, energy works, of how electricity works. Um, we're talking about um, the physical science of kinetic art. Um, which is art from any medium that contains movement perceivable by the viewer. So it's a good way for the, a fun way for the kids to explore electricity um, as a form of, of energy as doing these circuits. Another way of using circuits in the classroom is um, with paper circuits. And again, you need a tiny um, 3.2 volt battery, I believe it is, um, and some conductive tape. And um, you can create a picture and uh, the circuit lights up. Um, so I know in my classroom this um, kind of comes up, came about uh, with our light table. Um, it's kind of got a, a funny little switch that keeps going off and on. So the question at the light table was why does it keep, why does it keep lighting off and on again? Um, so we talked about the connection between circuits and um, it, it's not exactly um, maybe relevant to our curriculum per se, but it was it was an inquiry that the, the children have, and it was relevant to them because they were frustrated with the light table. So that's how we uh, kind of got into this a little bit. Um, Sphero art. So Sphero, this project came around after our investigation um, into what magnets can do. So I showed you those pictures a little bit earlier, but the pendulum and then the magnet art. So after experimenting with how the magnets can move the objects via a push or a pull, so we created artwork by dragging a magnet through the paint. And I showed you those pictures. Now, taking this a step further, um, I introduced the Spheros. So this allowed the students to create a similar type of artwork and to do, introduce them to the Sphero robots, which I'll eventually get into um, using in my classroom when we start, start talking about coding a little bit later in the year. Um, if you don't know, a Sphero is a robotic ball that you control with your smartphone or your tablet device. You can use block, code, block coding with it, or you can drive it, the, um, use your actual device kind of like as a, a steering wheel, and that's what these kids are doing in this picture. And there's, our, there's different versions of Sphero. Uh, you can go to Sphero.com um, to see the different versions um, and the price ranges. Um, and this one actually can be immersed in water, or you can roll it through, through paint. It's, it's uh, completely encased and that you can clean that up there. So the art, of course, is the visual art piece that involves some color mixing. Um, the math is the tilting of the device to control where the sphero is rolling. And the technology, of course, of course is the actual coding with the sphero machine. Uh, we connected this to uh, 1.4 visual arts in grade one and some self-regulation and well-being 2.2 in kindergarten. All right, this pendulum painting is an activity we did in our classroom last year. Our school had a big Canada Day celebration concert, and um, 
we wanted to do some art that we could have in the in the hallways as parents were coming down to the gym. Um, so we had looked at some YouTube videos on pendulums and talked a little bit about what a pendulum is and what it looks like and what it does. Um, and then we looked at some videos on um, people using pendulums to paint and we decided to try it. So on the left hand side you'll see we had um, two chairs and a stick going across the chairs and a cup with a hole in the bottom attached to the stick with some string. We extended that and like thought on it and re reflected a little bit and we ended up using a water bottle with um, a glue lid, uh, hot glue to the top of it so we could turn it on and off. We have to water down the paint a little bit. We put a tarp on the floor initially and then we had garbage bags on the floor. You also have to be a little bit comfortable with getting a little bit dirty <laughs> possibly here. Um, we had the kids come up. It's definitely an activity where there was an educator with them when they were using it. Some of the kids would come up and just gently tap it and it wouldn't spin very hard but we talked to them about how you have to kind of push it around in a circle and some of them would come and kind of whip it so that there might be paint going across the classroom. But they had a lot of fun with it and um, later in the spring we were able to take it outside and they were doing it with the water and uh, looking at the um, patterns that were made on the pavement with the water. The wonderful thing about it was that not one of, not any two of them looked the same and it created a wonderful uh, piece of art for our, our hallway um, during our Canada celebrations. So we connected this to uh, visual arts in grade one, using elements of design and artworks to communicate ideas, messages, and personal understandings, and uh, in belonging, contributing in kindergarten, exploring different elements of design in visual arts. All right, so we're on to our last subject, content area, uh, mass. So of course the process of understanding relationships among patterns, numbers, and shapes. Looking at the five strands of mathematics, number sense, geometry, measurement, data management, patterning. Uh, we're going to see another um, kit that I've designed using these parts. This is a geoboard kit. And uh, it can be used to practice fine motor skills when exploring with 2D shapes or when encouraging creative problem solving. The way I've connected this to STEAM learning is, of course, we've got some math, geometry, symmetry, visual, spatial skills, and the technology is the elastics the children are using. Um, there's nuts and bolts, and there's also some wooden pegs that they can insert into the, uh, the geo board to help them create with, uh, whatever they're building, whether it's shapes or recreation of a story. You can see this little girl with the purple shirt. She actually is retelling a story. She's building a castle, not, not just a house. But she's retelling a story that we were reading in the classroom. So some connections here are um, math, obviously, geometry, spatial sense, composing patterns, pictures, and designs. And of course, 17.1 for a kindergarten, explore, sorting, and compare the attributes and the properties of traditional, non-traditional shapes and figures. A little bit more about. All right, so, oops, sorry. <laughs> it's a little more about coding. So, on the left hand side, the children were using the coding board um, and some loose parts that they had created uh, characters for the story. There was no lady who swallowed a bat um, to retell the story using the coding board. And on the right hand side, um, that's Scratch Junior. Uh, which is a great tool for children to use to create their own stories or to uh, retell a familiar story for them. Uh, and we connected this with um, uh, reading in language in uh, grade one. So 1.4 dem demonstrating understanding of a text by re retelling the story or restating information from the text, including the main idea. And in kindergarten, problem solving and innovation, retelling experiences, events, and familiar stories in proper sequence. All right, we've got a picture of one of my little guys uh, comparing his size, but his body size to the wingspan of an eagle. So eagle inquiry into life sciences, the studying of birds in our school community. We saw an eagle uh, flying over top of our play space outside, um, which was pretty interesting. Um, the kids could tell that it was a really large bird, not, um, not a typical bird 
that we normally see. So that kind of got them starting. I mentioned before about the, the bird houses and whatnot. So this is, uh, this is a further inquiry a little bit later on in the year um, about some, what, what do we have in our community. And, and we've, we're lucky in our um, school community. We have uh, wetlands right behind our school. So we do actually see a lot of wildlife. So it's a really good connection for the kids to make, a personal connection to the community. So what they're doing here is they're measuring using their body, snap cubes, linking rings, um, and comparing our results of that measurement. <clears throat> so of course the technology piece are any of those loose parts materials like um, snap cubes and the linking rings. Any of those tools that the kids might have found around the classroom to do some uh, measurement comparisons. Um, so obviously, three one math and measurement. And in kindergarten, we've got 16.1, which talks about uh, select an attribute to measure and determine an appropriate non-standard unit of measure to measure, compare two or more objects. Um, so this example on this slide here is um, showing, uh, showing snowflakes and some reflective symmetry. So a common inquiry you uh, probably often hear in the winter, of course, is what do snowflakes look like? So what does symmetry mean? What does symmetry look like? Incorporating that open-endedness of using loose parts in the classroom. Um, a similar experience could, be, could develop in the spring or the fall surrounding ladybugs as well looking at the symmetrical patterns on, uh, on bugs or animals and their patterning on their coats. Um, so in grade one, math and geometry and spatial sense create symmetrical designs and pictures using concrete materials. Kindergarten, problem solving and innovation, recognize, explore, describe and compare patterns in the natural and built environment. For example, patterns in the design of buildings or in flowers or in animal coats. Okay, so I mentioned earlier about our class, um, our school challenges. So these are just some more examples of uh, class or all school challenges or even challenges that we've done at staff meetings for uh, co cooperative uh, activities. Um, one on the left-hand side is a balloon challenge. So they have to use tape and balloons to create a structure that's as tall as they can. And the middle one is a pipe cleaner challenge, and there are lots of different uh, kind of twists and turns that go into this challenge. It's about a 10 minutes and they have different, they're working in a group, but then they can't talk to each other and then they can only use one hand. So it's kind of interesting to uh, um, see how they adapt to those different challenges. I haven't tried this one with my kindergartens, but I um, think it would work really well with um, some older grades. And the one on the right hand side is a, uh, a cup challenge. So different sizes of cups and how tall can you build it. So your picture on your left here that you're seeing is a Lego challenge. Another quick way um, with using materials around your classroom. Uh, you can pose a question uh, for everybody or individual challenge cards to get kids involved in um, creating um, or developing a challenge using their uh, steam and those foundational skills that you've laid. Um, now, I'm sorry, it is a little bit hard to see in this one picture of the tree. Jenna circled uh, what I'd like you to try to focus on. And what you see is a hula hoop. So I showed this, my students this picture of the hula hoop in the tree as a way of sparking curiosity or interest in their surroundings. So it's a tree out in our play yard, and I have no idea how the hula hoop got in the tree. And actually, in fact, it's still there. We previously mentioned how good questions can really encourage children to think critically. So I thought showing them a picture like this would actually encourage them to ask more specific questions instead of why is the hula hoop there? Because of course we can't answer that. So um, different questions that I was encouraging the kids to ask in the model were how do you think the hoop, the hoop got in the tree? How, what could we do to get the hoop out of the tree? And what would happen if we left the hoop there? So just trying to think outside the box on those uh, why questions, try to get away from that so they have more critical thinking skills there. Um, so this is an idea that you could use um, if you wanted to get learn started on steam learning right away in your classroom. Um, you can take a familiar fairy tale, create a problem to solve from one character's point of view. What I'd like to do is try to encourage my students to think outside the box when selecting a problem to solve. So for example, for in the example, three billy goats cross, instead of challenging instead students of challenging to build a bridge for the goats to cross, an idea you could find um, 
um, many places online many places that you do see the example of that challenge. Of that challenge. But, but my idea was to encourage them to think, about, to think maybe about maybe the troll living under the bridge and what kind of problems he has and how he feels about what's happening when the goats come along. So maybe the troll is stuck under the bridge. So a question could be, or a challenge could be, how can you help him escape? Maybe the kids are going to build um, some kind of pulley system. Maybe they're going to build a rope, uh, use a rope or a staircase, that kind of thing. Um, another example um, for the three little pigs, instead of challenging to, to build houses for the pigs, maybe they can think of a solution to a problem that the wolf is having. Maybe the wolf is having a bad day. That's maybe his only problem, and maybe they can solve that in a creative way. You never know what the kids are thinking and their prior experiences. What I'm trying to do is kind of foster some empathy and creative thinking and practice some perspective taking. Um, so some of you may have heard of Kane's Arcade. Uh, Kane was a little boy who created a arcade in his father's in front of his father's shop um, out of cardboard, and it kind of created this phenomenon that um, grew into a website called Imagination.org and a global cardboard challenge. So we wanted to just share it with you. Um, if you have some time, you might want to watch it. It could be a great springboard um, to show your kids and to get their creative juices uh, going to uh, think about what they might be able to do um, to create something unique. So thank you very much for taking the time out of your night to be with us. Um, thank you, Trish, for moderating. And uh, I know that Trish has some things to share with you before we leave. Um, we'll still be here, so if you have questions, um, we'll uh, watch the chat box. And please feel free to email us if you have any further questions or wonderings. Wow, that was terrific. Thank you so much, Jennifer and Aaron. What a lot of great ideas. It actually turned out well that you got cut off for a bit so we could catch up in the chat and have some discussion. So thank you so much for everything you've done and all your efforts you've put into this. Uh, you are right, I do have a few more things to do, but just before I do, I'm going to turn off the recording and then uh, I have a couple of things to paste in the chat. <laughs>